pleasant evening to all our listeners and welcome to the Anglican Voice. The Anglican Voice is brought to you by the Incorporated Trustees of the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. I am joined today with my dear friend from the Southland, the musical genius, Miss Michelle Dorich. How are you, Michelle? Good evening, Mark. I'm very well considering the weather. So good to be here with you. Yes, and today is a beautiful day. I mean, I'm not biased because of the color red today, but today we celebrate with the color red because of Pentecost. So it just happens to be one of the better colors, but you know, we celebrate today <laughs> um, Pentecost, as commonly known as well as Whit Sunday. But um, before we begin this evening's program, I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, on day you open the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shared abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the holy sacraments that it may reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Live inside of us. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Live inside of us. for that prayer mark the college for pentecost yes yes and today we have as a very special guest the right reverend claude Berkeley, bishop of trinidad and tobago good evening bishop claude good evening michelle and mark and a very special pentecost greeting to all your listeners near and far thank you thank you thank you thank you and bishop, a warm we, welcome to you yes bishop we missed you on the program it has been too long since we have had you here as a guest and you know it's a, it's a blessing that you said yes on this pentecost sunday to join us today um and then well, thank you very much. <laughs> and bishop i know you have been busy I know you have been, you have had a lot of things going on, so I hope everything is well and coming to come at home and, well, out of various challenges. By God's grace, you are getting over them. Well, as you said, by God's grace, God is faithful indeed. And I have, over the past few months, have my, have another version 
of God's goodness and grace and an experience that rivals all the others in terms of walking with God, trusting in his goodness, and seeing his work before my very eyes. So yes, it has been demanding. It has also been a tremendous experience of God's grace and glory. Praise God. And this evening, Mark, especially as we have the bishop with us, yes. our topic today, our conversation will center on, first of all, synod and, of course, the work of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Pentecost today. So, Bishop, synod is coming. What is synod all about? We hear about synod coming every year. And I know, we've Mark, we've talked about this topic a few times, but yes. let's focus maybe on the younger ones who are probably now old enough to understand. What is the synod of the Anglican Church? Okay. The Synod of the Anglican Church is like an annual general meeting, can be compared to that of the body corporate, that is, of the whole church. We have delegates from parishes, and we have 30 parishes and one district. So we have delegates from the parishes, we have church officials, we have been accepting and receiving observers, and the bishop is the president of this meeting. And at this meeting, which is the highest decision-making body of the church, the decisions are made about our year ahead and uh, in fact years ahead and uh, matters for our well-being and the good order of the church will be discussed and decided upon at this forum. And Bishop, and you said it matters to the church. How important is it? Because I know that we in 2019, 2020, we would not have had synod. And by the grace of God, things settled a bit last year. We had synod last year. Between 2021 and 2022, that period where it had a lot of shifts due to COVID and other aspects, how has the church adjusted to the various, for example, preparation for synod in aspect of being able to produce reports, being able to do what they are supposed to do as mandated in Synod 2021. Okay. First of all, the COVID pandemic uh, thrust us into responding technologically using the virtual platforms and conducting business in a different way. And in fact, the, the last synod was a virtual synod. And this synod again is a virtual synod again. So that, that tells you that there has been a tremendous adjustment. But also, in the generation of reports and other matters pertinent to the church's business, the, we have to find a way to work to get the work done. We have to be adaptable. In fact, we are Christians and that must mean that we look at the passage from the Hebrews, for example, to talk about the struggle of Christians, the issues they faced, the persecution they faced, but yet the message and the word of God and the mission of the church continued. It's no different in, in a time like this. And sometimes we tend to become a little too comfortable, too relaxed. But actually, the task requires 
adaptability, capacity, and determination. So with that, with those tools, the communication went by emails and other means, and meetings were convened through this a similar platform, the Zoom platform and other platforms. So the business was conducted, except that it was not conducted in an in-person way uh, to any significant extent. The in-person meetings were reduced and the meetings were, yet meetings were conducted uh, virtually. And so the communication with the parishes uh, occurred. And, 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 and therefore, another matter of the synod, I want to uh, interject here, and I'm happy you're asking that because I, I am seeing that a number of people are not aware or do not seek to understand what kind of church it is they belong to in terms of how we function. When synod is not in uh, effect, so to speak, there is a body called the Diocesan Council. And the Diocesan Council is the body that can function in the stead of synod, where when synod is not in uh, is not meeting, the Diocesan Council conducts the business uh, going forward. So you, you have different levels of what we might call authority and decision-making. And so even if Synod is not there, is not set, it's the highest body, but then the Diocesan Council is authorized to take some decisions in the stead of Synod. So in all that has happened, even if we were not able to function in the what I would call the regular way, we quickly adapted to functioning virtually and in other ways that we, to which we were not uh, accustomed. But yet the business had to go on and I want to commend uh, clergy and people for the extra effort that was taken to keep the business of the church going. For example, the Anglican voice was very prominent in communicating whatever information uh, it received to the wider community, Anglican community, and the wider uh, population and listening public uh, as they tuned in to hear what you had to offer. Right, so Bishop, thank you so much for that. I just have one more question though. Um, so you said the Diocese and Council carries, continues to carry on the work of Synod when Synod is not meeting, is not in session. How does information from the Synod and maybe even Diocese and Council, how does that information, how is that information relayed back to the general laity, the congregations? How do they get information? Formed or are aware of what's happening in the church, especially at the synod level. Okay, I I caution you that the you are asking a very penetrative kind of question, but all questions in that sense are <laughs> it is not an illegitimate question. <laughs> and I'm saying that because one of the our core values as a church is communication. And every, in every way you try to look at it, communication is our core business. Go and tell. Go into all the world, baptizing and teaching and carrying the message of Christ and so forth. Communication is our business, yet we seem to have a challenge in this area of the communication. Because after the each parish sends delegates to the synod, and it is a standing practice that if you are sent, you return and you complete the errand on which you were sent. That is the message that we get from ascension in the sense that Jesus was sent into the world to reconcile us to God, 
to procure our salvation in Christ. And when he was done, when his business was done, he returned to sit at the right hand of God. Those are messages in our theological projection and deliberation. But those must also be messages which we actually practice. <laughs> so each delegate or delegates, because sometimes there are more than one uh, delegate, must return to the parish. An ample opportunity must be given to share the outcomes of Synod. What uh, were the major things raised? What were the recommendations uh, given? And how do we press on? Because the matters raised at Synod and out of which recommendations or resolutions actually might arise affect the wider body of the church. It might be raised by, they rather, might be raised by one parish, but it might be a matter that affects several parishes. So when we do not communicate to the people in the pew on the given days or as the case might be, and today we have a greater means of communication. Traditionally, we would have a, a, an oral presentation. But today, we can have that same oral presentation. We can have an emailed report of the Synod. We can have uh, that which is put up on a screen and, uh, and, and, and shared. We can have excerpts of it by WhatsApp. Different measures of sharing the outcomes of the Synod, the business of the church with the wider community. It is something which is of concern to myself and a number of others. How is the communication handled? How does the business of Synod reach the, the, the person in the pew and achieve the effect or effects expected and anticipated by mounting the whole exercise in the first place? Thank you, Bishop. And at this point in time, we take a short musical break. So we'll be right back after this.
And now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Pentecost. We sing, fire, 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 fire fall on me. Bishop Pentecost. Bishop, How many days? Bishop, before you go to Bishop there, yeah, you know, I think I'm biased to Pentecost for a few reasons, you know. That song, fire, 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 but we, we, I mean, I have a special bias towards fire, you know, and then of course that is the season, is the red season. But anyhow, sorry about that. You can go. <laughs> and as a little <laughs> song would say, Mark, we don't want no water to put this fire out, okay? No, 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 no. Hold your hand on the hose. <laughs> 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 but yes, Bishop, coming back to my question. <laughs> Pentecost. How many, how long after Easter did we celebrate Pentecost? And what is Pentecost? Why is it such a major feast in the church? Okay, thank you for the question. Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. And the, the, the Pente uh, gives you that kind of, uh, let's say, prefix which will connote its meaning and its quantum. But Pentecost, 50 days, and it was a feast, a harvest feast, a time of the day after the seventh uh, Sabbath, so to speak, in the Jewish calculation of things. And so it's a 50-day marker. It is an important festival because in many understandings for the church, what has happened is you have Jewish associations in terms of their liturgy, worship, and religious system, and Christians having emerged out of Judaism uh, transferred some of those associations and connections. So. What happened is that the Feast of Pentecost sort of marks the time of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And that is replaced by the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost for the new dispensation, if you will. So at this uh, point in time and uh, uh, today, that's a major celebration for Christians. Now we, we, we have a little sub uh, theme there, to, something to be included, because you have a 50 day celebration as observed in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter two, but you have a same day uh, giving of the spirit as we observe in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. So that uh, you can have a debate there about when is the actual Pentecost or when did it happen? But I want to go further to say that Pentecost is inseparable from Easter. What the church did, as with Ascension, is that because the Easter experience was such a compact one, the church extended and had good biblical reason to extend. The church extended the season, let's call it that, so that it could give adequate emphasis to the different aspects of one compact, compounded experience. The experience is Easter, the coming again from the dead of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the defeat of death and the grave and hell, and actually reminding us powerfully that God has the last say, the last word. And so what we are doing is pulling it apart. It has been pulled apart. And we now have some time to focus on 
this aspect of the work, the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church, and in a very important way, examine and re-examine the, the life of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, the person of the Spirit, as it applies to our Christian life and witness. Thank you so much, Bishop, for that. Quite a history lesson. So, therefore, what is or who is the Holy Spirit? We talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have this day dedicated to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, we, and I know in other churches we talk about the birth of the church at Pentecost. Who or what is the Holy Spirit and what is his, his or its role? Well, there's an interesting uh, answer to that in this, uh, sort of in this Sunday's, today's uh, gospel. Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And what Philip is actually doing there is trying to clarify, to, to, to have as clearly as it is possible, some aspects of the mystery that uh, he is experiencing and living. In Trinitarian language, we will say the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God at work in the world and in the church, even now. Now, in the response that Jesus gave, is that the Holy Spirit is that action of God, present and active and effective, while Jesus has returned to sit at the right hand of the Father. So we will have a line like, I will not leave you comfortless. In other words, it is not as if God were abandoning you by going back to the Father. And you can see that uh, displayed in different texts in the Gospel of John, for example. So that God at work in the world, the Holy Spirit, which will cause empowerment, the Holy Spirit, which will bring confidence, which will help through the determination of the, the disciples and others involved in the church to attain what we might call extraordinary undertakings and achievements by trusting and believing in God's work among us, present with us. And I want to say that use the opportunity to point to our catechism. There is a section, God the Holy Spirit. There are about five uh, inputs in the catechism is written as a sort of question and answer uh, format so that one can go back to it, look at it again and see what further questions you have in terms of trying to understand that there is a presence of the Holy Spirit. Now I want to go a little further to say one of the things that Philip's question evoked is that by Jesus' answer, he was saying, the Holy Spirit, we can see, we cannot see God and be there for his action, but we can experience. And when I say by but be there for his action, I mean his live action, but we can experience God. I can go to Acts chapter 2, the narration there on that fateful Pentecost day. We see, we hear of a rushing mighty wind. We hear of tongues of fire. We hear of people speaking in other 
uh, uh, tongues and a, a great crisscrossing of, of, of languages and the use of tongues and the communication of a message from God on that occasion. So that nobody there saw God per se. But Pentecost reminds us that by the work of the Holy Spirit, we have that grand opportunity to experience God at work, to experience God's transforming grace, God's miraculous action in so many different uh, parts of it. And it is something of that I was alluding to at the beginning of the, the program when, when I said, you know, the last so many months gave me a, a, a new edition, a new version of the power of this God that we serve and uh, how he can work and what he can do, what he actually does, what he did and what he will continue to do by that same Holy Spirit. So yes, we show us the Father. Jesus says, have you seen me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And a part of what it is, and what must concern us, is God present with us. God is present with us through his Holy Spirit. Are we listening to God and his Holy Spirit, or are we listening to ourselves? Or are we reasoning ourselves uh, into nothingness? Or are we becoming so uh, self-opinated, so to speak, that we run off with ourselves in parts unknown? One thing we know for sure, that God is a God of order and not of confusion. And so there is a unifying kind of power that the Spirit uh, releases unto those that trust in His goodness. I'll pause there for the moment. i probably come back with some aspect from the Catechism. So, Bishop, my next question to you. A lot of people believe that the Holy Spirit only came to be on the day of Pentecost. We know that the Holy Spirit existed from the, from the inception and creation, how can you assist in, re, in answering this query that people may have? Okay. And that, that sometimes requires some kind of a exegesis type lesson. But from the beginning, when in the creation, God spoke. The God, the word was reproduced in a plurality. Let us do this or that, as the case might be. And more than that, we use the word, there are some words that were used in the translations which indicated wind or breath. Those words, Hebrew root, translated into our English understanding, those words point to the presence of that spirit-like uh, aspect of God's action. In fact, from the very beginning, we do not have a personal, uh, personal meaning to say a person, a touch, an in-person, like a human uh, experience or expression or description of God's life. So he walked in the garden with Adam, but we don't know that it is another man that was walking with Adam or another being, so to speak. So the, the, the issue of God being spirit, we begin with that. 
And the manifestations or the way that God is uh, experienced, so to speak, leads us to do this partitioning that we're trying to do here. That's why some people have a real serious problem with uh, a Trinitarian conversation. Because what we're saying is we've experienced God as Father and Creator and so forth. We have experienced God as Son. And we have experienced God as Holy Spirit. And across the Old Testament and the New Testament, we will find references to God as the Spirit. Now, they are not as, they may not be as straightforward as we would want to see them lined up. But the cross references can be lifted out to explain and to account for why we think of God as the Holy Spirit. But when we come down to the Gospel of John, absolutely and clearly, you see the words advocate, paraclete, counselor, and so forth, used to describe that which will follow Jesus' uh, departure back to the heavens, so to speak. Bishop, before we reach, we close with this segment. Any parting words for us this evening on this on the topic of Pentecost or even Synod? Well, I would like to say that we are in a season. We, we, we try to do things in seasons. And during the seasons, we have certain emphases. This is an important aspect of our understanding because sometimes people say, well, you, you, you're going to fast in Lent, but you're not fasting only any other time? No, there's no, um, there's no rule or law that says we only need to fast one time of, of, of the year. It is the time of emphasis. And that's what happens in the seasons. So in this season of Pentecost and the associated aspects of Easter, really, we are really pondering the sacred mysteries of this great Easter event. And I would like to encourage us to continue to learn more and, and learning meaning by active engagement and encounter. In that spirit, we must pay attention to our 150th anniversary as a diocese and the 200th anniversary of the dedication of the Holy Trinity Church, which will come up uh, soon after. And in all of that, our intention and what we've begun to do to raise funds for the restoration of the Holy Trinity Cathedral. So that we have a lot of, we have a packed program. And I would like to, let's say, encourage all our members or friends or well-wishers to join with us to help us to continue to provide true and laudable service to this nation in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bishop Claude. And Bishop, thank you for raising that little point about you know, our anniversaries that are coming up because that leads straight into our other feature, our newest feature in Anglican Voice over these last two months, Journey Around the Diocese. And today we feature St. Matthias in Laventil. Enjoy. Good day to my brothers and sisters in Christ in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. Today I want to share with you some thoughts about the parish of St. Matthias, which comprises the congregations of St. Matthias Laventil, St. Columba Barataria, the Church of the Epiphany Mova, and the Santa Cruz Mission. We should also mention that we have two primary schools, Barataria EC or St. Columba Anglican and Mova. Anglican or 
the Church of the Epiphany Anglican School. And we have this in Columba, Early Childhood Center. And now we go to the history. Look at the history, a brief history of the St. Matthias Parish. This was written by the late Bernard Riley, the reader, and as we would say today, one of the guiding lights of the St. Matthias Church and Parish. He says, The St. Matthias Church, situated on the eastern main road, Laventil, is the 13th Anglican Church to be built in Trinidad. There is no date of its actual construction, but its consecration took place June 3rd, 1855. The church has been dedicated to Matthias, who is regarded as the 13th apostle. He having been chosen to fill the place of Judas Iscariot. The design and structure of this stone building is particularly English in character, given rise to the fact that it was either built by Englishmen or by slaves under the direction and supervision of an Englishman duly qualified in the trade. That it has stood for almost one and a half centuries or more than one and a half centuries without any structural change, its proportions so accurate and walls perpendicular speaks volumes to its strength and beauty. The land on which this edifice stands was donated by Mr. William Pashley. It was situated between the Laventil foothills and the swampy marsh, marsh of the mangrove area. There was no eastern main road, nor any drainage, and this presented a major problem to the early worshippers. They had to wade through high grass and bush from the old St. Joseph Road, and often, when they got near to the church, there was water all around. It was then a popular sight to see the would-be worshippers traveling with shoes in hand and entering the interior of the church from the western door before these shoes were transferred to their feet. The church, having been built in the Laventil area, came under the administration of the parish of Holy Trinity, but its inaccessibility and mosquito infestation militated against its early development. It was only after the construction of the eastern main road that the western door of the church was closed in, and a small porch built on the northern side. Services were held more regularly but mostly by lay leaders, lay ministers. While there was an increase in the attendance, it was not significant as people had already grown accustomed to their travels to Port of Spain, and many of the poor conditions, mosquito infestation, straight back pews, and a lack of accommodation persisted. Coupled with these came the leaks in various parts of the roof. It was during the period of the Second World War that the roof was changed to corrugated galvanized sheets. But it was found that these sheets were so noisy during a downpour of rain that they were quickly removed and a concrete roof installed. The sheets of galvanized were then used in the building of a home on the premises for the sexton. Many of the people who complained of their long giving for the erection of a new church have forgotten that these were the things done with their pennies and cents. In 1945, the MOVA housing development commenced, and by 1947, a rectory and a school for the Anglicans were established at MOVA. Father Ernest G. Silman, a curate of the cathedral, was sent out to reside at Mova. His responsibilities were to oversee the Laventil Church and take care 
of the Anglicans in the housing area. It was then that the work of this church began to flourish. The Church of St. Columba, built by Reverend Father Charles Ragby during his retirement from active service in 1934, was already well established. In building this church, Father Ragby had as his aim the evangelism of the Indians whose population was increasing rapidly there in the Barataria area. By 1947, Father Ragbear's health was deteriorating and when he died in 1949, the work there fell to Father Silman. It was due to this that the parish of St. Matthias was formed. A word on the Church of the Epiphany. Worship for Anglicans in Mova did not begin in the present structure. Worship began for Anglicans downstairs of the rectory after Father Silman had moved into the building. In 1954, work began on the present structure and by 1958, worship began, even though the building was not fully completed. The original entrance of the church was on the western side, but when Canon Winston Lamont was made rector in 1963, this was changed to the eastern side. The parish of St. Matthias was inaugurated on February 24, 1951, with the resident priest, Father E. G. Silman, being made its first rector. St. Matthias Parish was carved out from the parishes of Holy Saviour in the east, its eastern boundary being the west bank of the San Juan River, all saints in the north, its boundary there being the Saddle Road from its junction with the Maracas Road and Holy Trinity from Picton Road in Laventille and the Beatham Estates on the west and the south. The church today, in its present location and its facilities, is well poised to become the focal point of the parish in the near future. And just one other voice that I would like to share, that is the voice of Canon Winston A. Lamont, who said in this brochure that I am using, in congratulating the Vestry of St. Matthias with all other members of the worshipping community, I do hope and pray that you will continue to be that rare gem subject to change, but not diminished in purpose. I pray that you will contribute significantly to the ongoing life of the Church in this diocese and assist by offering quality example to this and many generations yet unborn. May St. Matthias flourish under God for him and the betterment of his people. St. Matthias Parish has had some accomplishments and I'm proud to share them with you. One, St. Matthias Parish was one of the first to start a steel pan group which competed with merit at several past national music festivals. Two, Miss Sylvia Robin, then organist at St. Columba Anglican Church, regularly tutored interested adults and the children in the Barataria and the surrounding community in steel pan playing and the music theory. Three, the Columba Anglican Youth Group, CAYG, organized several youth collection concerts which featured offerings from youth across the diocese, all without social media, mind you. One of the most notable ones were held in honor of Dr. Dawn Batson, a former parishioner at the St. Columba Church in 2000. Out of this effort, two of the then youth musicians gained partial scholarship to study music at the university where Dr. Batson taught at the time. Four, partnering with the bar Barataria Dojo of Shotokan Karate International Federation of Trinidad and the Tobago Branch and its Sensei Celeste Nottingham for over 20 years 
to provide a safe space for training children and adults. Five, a homework center was organized for several years at St. Matthias Church by a Mrs. Stella Thomas, parishioner which tutored and fed children from the nearby Laventil Boys and Girls Government School. Six, in 2015, the refurbished parish hall was renamed the Wilfred T. Carrington Hall to honor Father Carrington, who negotiated for the previous building to be built to house the Barataria Anglican the Primary School during its reconstruction and repurposed it into the original parish hall once it was vacated. I thank you for this opportunity to just show you a few highlights of what our parish is doing. We the Anglicans must keep forging forward and gaining more understanding and being closer to God as much as we can for the parish and the wider community. I thank you for the opportunity. Peace be with you. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Michelle, 
I would like to say thank you to your beautiful host as well. Listen, always bring that extra energy. I love hosting with you. I love hosting with everybody. To your other hosts of Young Cup Boys, I love you all. Michelle, you know, you bring that unique aspect to it. I mean, thank you for having, being here with me today. And to Bishop Claude, oh gosh, yeah. thank you so, so, so much. Thank you for saying yes. And for joining us, I know your he- your schedule is ridiculously hectic, especially now with Pentecost, Senna, the same week of Pentecost, and other matters. I just want to say thank you very much for saying yes to being on the program with us today. You're very welcome. A pleasure to be able to serve when I can and how I can, by the grace of God. And we hope you are no stranger to the Anglican voice. We, 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 we look forward to you being our guest again as soon as we get the chance. Well, you have a sense that I will not impose myself on the Anglican. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bishop, you won't impose, but you will <laughs> gladly, when you can, accept our invitation. And like yes. Mark, and I'm sure on behalf of the diocese, I too would like to say thank you and wish you and your family all the best. May the Holy Spirit and, of course, God continue to guide, to heal, and to do in your lives as he wills. And Bishop, can you close for us with a word of prayer as we close this evening's session? Yes. I'd like to say thank you to the diocese as a whole for prayer support for kind words, for gifts, and for their love during the last so many months when we had illness in the family and more recently the passing of my mother. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have sent the Holy Spirit among us. And by that Spirit, You have led us to new understandings and new truths. Help us to continue to have a right mind in our deliberations, in our exchanges, and in making our commitment to you. By that Holy Spirit, O God, we are able to transcend barriers. Empower us by that means so that The challenges which lie before us, we can undertake, we can complete, and we can give glory to your holy name. Help us not to be lazy in seeking to know more and more about you. For in that knowledge, in that exposure, you bring us to a new place and you set us to complete what you have asked us to do in faith and to strive to bring into being your glory. We pray for all these benefits and these good gifts through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we are the Anglican Voice. Again, thank you, Bishop. And we remind all our listeners that we are on again next week, please God, on I-95.5 FM on the Anglican Outlook on Facebook, the Anglican Outlook TV, on YouTube. We are on next week. Please, God, we ask you to continue during the course of this week to raise the Synod in prayer, to continue to raise our members of clergy in prayer and all of our Synod representatives. And next week, God's willing, we'll be doing a special topic addressing violence in schools. So we are asking you to please tune in for that. Look out for that. Set your reminders. It will be a powerful discussion. We ask you to continue to remember us in prayer. And thank you. Michelle, thank you once again. You're welcome, Mark. Thank you, too. Until we meet again. God bless. Yeah.